our solar system was formed around four and a half billion years ago from a great swirling cloud of gas and dust. Gravity started to act on this matter and much of it fused together at the centre to create a star, our sun. At the same time, smaller bodies began colliding with each other to create the planets. Later, a cataclysmic collision took place between two planets of unequal size. The remainder of the larger body formed what we now call the Earth. The debris of the smaller planet flew off into space and eventually condensed to form a satellite body, the Moon. The Earth was large enough to retain its atmosphere, but the Moon was not. These two bodies were subjected to millions of years of meteorite bombardment. Weathering processes have removed much of the evidence from meteorite impact on Earth, but obvious craters remain on the Moon. Earth eventually cooled to form seas and land, but its ever-restless surface reflected its hot, radioactive core. The land masses on the surface of our planet are continually moving, breaking apart and colliding with each other. This process has created and destroyed many different continents since the formation of Earth. About 480 million years ago, the separate tectonic plates, which were eventually to create the British Isles, lay south of the equator. Three plates, which geologists call Laurentia, Baltica and Avalonia, began to move together. Laurentia carried rocks now seen in Scotland, Greenland and North America. Baltica carried Sweden, Finland and Russia and Avalonia carried England, Wales and Southern Ireland. When these plates collided, some 430 million years ago, it created the Caledonian mountain chain. As a result of this collision, the marine sedimentary rocks on the margins of Laurentia were subjected to immense pressure and crumpled up into alpine-sized mountains. The deeply eroded roots of these mountains can be seen today all over the highlands, with particularly fine examples around Loch Aber. Shortly after the main mountain building episode had reached its climax, the temperature and pressure conditions beneath the surface of the earth caused some of the rocks to melt. Somewhere near the present position of the Nevis range, the molten rock, or magma, burst to the surface. Explosive eruptions covered the land with great jumbled blocks of volcanic rock. Lava was spewed out from a volcano, filling in hollows and engulfing the existing landscape. Again and again, the lava erupted and piled up on the land. When the lava cooled, it formed a dark grey rock called andesite. This rock is named after the spectacular Andes Mountains in Southern America, where such rock is particularly common. Eventually, the eruption ceased, and for many years, all was quiet in Loch Aber. But, deep within the earth, molten rock was still being formed. This new magma was more viscous than before and cooled slowly within the crust to form a rock with large crystals which is known as the outer granite of Ben Nevis. This rock is well seen on Anach Moor. After this granite had crystallised, tension in the Earth's crust created a series of parallel vertical cracks into which new magma forced its way. When this magma cooled, in turn it created a suite of features which geologists call dikes. These are orientated in a northeast to southwest direction and are responsible for the numerous gullies on the western flank of Anach Moor. Yet another large body of molten rock then formed in the crust. This time, the pressure which built up in the magma chamber started to dome up the overlying rocks cracks began to develop in the roof of the magma chamber. 
when the magma subsided slightly, the roof could no longer support itself, and a huge cylindrical block of rock began to collapse into the granite magma below. At the same time, a vast amount of ash and lava escaped around the margins of the block. In a cataclysmic series of events, which would have sent ash high up into the atmosphere, a huge crater called a caldera was formed at the surface. The rocks, now forming the summit of Ben Nevis, collapsed down at least 600 metres, or 2,000 feet, when this caldera was formed. This process was termed cauldron subsidence by the geologists who first mapped the Ben Nevis area a century ago. Evidence for a similar caldera was found in Glencoe. Loch Aber was the first place in the world where such structures were identified in ancient rocks. The body of magma beneath the Ben Nevis caldera eventually cooled to form the inner granite of Ben Nevis. This rock is well exposed on Carmor Jerig. It is redder in colour than the outer granite and does not contain any dikes. The downfaulted block from the former roof of the magma chamber was trapped within the inner granite as it cooled. This block is made up of a great pile of andesite lavas and volcanic brichas sitting on a basement of metamorphic rocks. You cross onto this collapsed block just after the third corner on the major zigzags on the mountain track up the western flank of Ben Nevis. After its spectacular formation, the Ben Nevis caldera was subjected to the forces of erosion. By 300 million years ago, the once mighty Caledonian mountains had been worn right down and vast quantities of rock had been washed into the sea. Then, around 60 million years ago, there was another major episode of igneous activity along what is now the west coast of Scotland. Huge volcanoes erupted on Mull, Rum and Skye. This was all linked to the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean as Scotland began to separate from Greenland. Some long fissures developed in the Earth's crust at this time into which a new set of dikes was intruded. The dikes from the Sky Igneous Centre run in a northwest to southeast direction. One of these much younger dikes can be seen on the Ben Nevis path between the two aluminium bridges. Possibly as a result of this rifting process, the Scottish Highlands were then uplifted and the roots of the Caledonian Mountains were resurrected to create the new Caledonian Mountains. As always, these new mountains were subjected to erosion. Around two million years ago, a new agent of erosion started to give Ben Nevis its final sculpting. The climate on Earth began to cool and an ice age started. The climate has fluctuated ever since between intensely cold periods, when huge glaciers have developed, and much warmer periods when ice has disappeared. During the coldest periods, the whole of northern Britain would have been completely covered in ice. At other times, the highest peaks would have remained exposed above the ice and been subjected to intense freeze-thaw action. The repeated sculpting by glaciers has created sharp ridges such as the Carmor Jerigaret, spectacular hollows such as Corina Keast, and deep U-shaped valleys such as Glen Nevis. In the most recent glacial episode, which ended 11,500 years ago, the upper part of Ben Nevis remained above the ice. This was when freeze-thaw action produced the large rock fragments called Blockfield, which now cover the ground on the upper part of the mountain. Thanks to mountain building, fire and ice, the highlands of Scotland, 
and in particular Loch Aber, has one of the most breathtaking landscapes in the world. No part of this story is more amazing than how Britain's highest mountain was formed. <laughs>